Does everybody, uh, does anybody hear, hear me? Yeah, I got you loud and clear on this end, man. Cool. So I guess we can, uh, I think if everybody's here, we can kick this off. You guys got, I all see the, uh, the screen. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, this is, this is actually going to be a, uh, repeat course from, uh, we've already done this, but I think we kind of blew through it, uh, uh, a year ago. Um, and, uh, we were just kind of, kind of go back over this. Um, we're going to go in and, uh, uh, over the, uh, and put inputs and outputs of, uh, of, uh, control system. So, <clears throat> we'll just kind of go through this and should be pretty quick. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, just wanted to cover just how simple um, the inputs and outputs of any control system are um, and how it, you guys already pretty much know everything you can do uh, for diagnosing and uh, interfacing with it can be done with a normal digital analog meter. I mean, digital multimeter, whether it's digital or analog. So now we've been using a lot of uh, VFDs and some of the Mavericks. So we'll do a VFD course again uh, later as well. Um, but even the complex stuff like the, the digital uh, motor controllers and uh, variable frequency drives can all be diagnosed and interfaced with using a digital multimeter. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, in the control system, the digital inputs, when you hear something referred to as digital, that just means it's, it's, a, it's a state of either on or off. It's a switch basically. So in the digital world, one is on, zeros off, uh, just like your uh, uh, meter is going to read uh, uh, continuity. So if you're, uh, it's either go or no go, it's either on, on or off. It's a, it's a relay. Um, <clears throat> and then the way the board knows that, so with microthermal and, and CPC, um, and many of the other controllers, it's going to produce an, a very, very tiny, tiny amount of DC electricity. So the reason, the way your, your electrical meter knows that there's continuity through it is because on one side of the wire, it's got continuity. And when you connect, or on one side of the wire, your test lead, it's got uh, a slight amount of electricity on it. And then when you touch the leads together, it returns that voltage to the other side and it knows that the wires are now connected. A control system that's doing that uses the same, same method um, and we call those dry contacts. If, uh, if the control system uses what's called wet contacts, Wetted contacts just simply means that there's an actual detectable amount of voltage on one of the wires leaving the controller and then the controller expects to see a certain amount of that voltage back on the other side of it. Generally, um, wetted contacts are used a lot in automation type of equipment, um, not so much in, in the, in the uh, uh, control system, more advanced control systems like what, we're, what, what we use. Um, but if you ever hear anybody utilizing the term wet contacts or dry contacts, it's that. It's the wet means that there's actually voltage present. And sometimes you got to be careful with that because if you ground that voltage out, you can blow a fuse or damage the power supply for the controller that's, that's using it. Um, <clears throat> with a digital input for a control system, there's really only two possibilities in a failure mode. There's either a problem with the switch, where it's a problem in the field um, or the wiring, or the controller itself is unable to read the uh, read the uh, read its own output and its own, and consequently its own back input. <clears throat> so 
with that, with all of our inputs and outputs that we're sending in and out, you have to kind of understand what it is that the controller is actually asking for the system to do. So it's, it's a fundamental, um, it's imperative that you kind of know the sequence of operation for anything that we're working on, right? I don't, I don't think I have to really explain that, but um, keep in mind that uh, there's several variables beyond just the circuit board or beyond just the control system that can prevent the control system from doing its job. So that's just one, one important thing um, to keep in mind anytime you are uh, interfacing with a control system. So we'll, we'll, we'll give an example of the absolute most basic of all um, functions of a control system and that is a simple switch and in this case We'll discuss what's actually come up a couple times recently uh, with door switches. So we'll just use an example of a door switch, um, uh, which can, as simple as it is, cause some headaches. So a door switch is typically a little tiny magnetic reed switch. So as soon as a magnet gets close to it, that little reed switch is going to change its state. Some door switches uh, come with uh, two wires, some come with three. If it's a two wire, um, it's gonna either be a normally open or a normally closed um, switch. So you've got to understand that uh, some of those switches uh, and some of the controllers are programmed um, to either close when the door is closed or open when the door is closed. Or, or it could have a set of both wires or both contacts inside of it. Um, the magnet has to be able to be positioned properly in order to operate the switch. Um, and uh, then the controller also has to be configured properly to indicate the status of that door. So there's a couple different variables here involved with just the format and settings up of a, of a door switch. So you've got the actual wiring of the door switch, the position of the magnet, and then the controllers uh, programmed reaction or indication of what that door switch uh, is doing and what it represents uh, is. And the same is true with uh, any other switch throughout the system, whether it's an oil fail. Oh, look at that. I spelled oil fail wrong. That's a nice, uh, that's a nice uh, typo there for everybody to see. Uh, motor modules, demand cooling, um, high limit switches, anything in the system uh, that, that the control system is going to read a digital, digital closure or a digital open. So uh, there's a couple points of possible confusion on, on throughout the system on, uh, on the state of, a, state of a digital switch. So let's go in through one, one scenario here. And we've had this happen several times at, at the Maverick stores, and, and I'm sure you've experienced it in, in other uh, places for, with your uh, other customers and jobs. So here we've got a situation where we've got a door open alarm, but we call the store and the store says, no, the door is closed. So the controller is not indicating a closure. So. I get calls and I'm sure you guys have experienced calls where uh, the computer is wrong and the control system's at fault because it's not registering a door closure when the door is actually closed. So in this case, we've got to do a little bit more investigation. So somebody's got to go out there, right? And when you get out there um, to properly diagnose what's going on, why is the control system not registering the door being closed, even though the door is physically closed? So in this scenario, we just disconnect a, a wire at the board to ensure the board will not, um, you got to disconnect at least one of the wires to make sure that your meter is not going to interfere with the, with the uh, reading of the board. Some inexpensive meters put out enough of a signal where you put uh, when you put if you were to put your meter on the control systems dry contacts it could change the state 
of, uh, of the uh, control system. So just be, be advised. If you've got a, a good meter, like a fluker or a good field piece or something, um, you're not gonna have to worry about that. Um, but just keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> and so basically the first thing we wanna do is verify with your meter what the control system is actually reading because we're not gonna assume that the control system is, is right or wrong at this point. What we wanna do is verify what it is that we see that's going on. So in this case, we'll check the physical input wiring at the, at the board um, first. And uh, to do that, we'll take off one of the wires and we'll read the wires leaving the board with your meter. So in other words, we're going to check continuity across the wires at the control board. And uh, if your meter doesn't indicate that do the door is actually closed, and again, here we have to back up one, one step before I get along too fast here. We have to know whether or not the state of the uh, magnetic switch is going to be closed with the door closed or open with the door closed. You'll need to know that before you do this uh, uh, test. So in this scenario, we're gonna uh, second guess what the controller's seeing. We're gonna put our meter on there. And in this case, we're actually going to uh, see that uh, the magnetic switch is in fact not closed. So the meter is not gonna beep when, uh, when the door is closed. And then therefore we're gonna have to do a little bit of further investigation. So, <clears throat> The switch, the magnet, is quite a ways from the from the uh, where the controller board is at. Um, so there's several points of possible failure along the um, along the path before it goes to the to the switch. <clears throat> so in this case, the computer is actually registering the right reading, um, but the door does not indicate that it's actually closed. So we've got to go and physically look at what's going on. So in this case, this was an actual scenario where uh, we went over to the magnet and sure enough, the door is closed. However, at the installation of the uh, component, at the installation of this, we'll see that the installation, when it was done, was not done properly according to the installation guidelines of this particular magnetic switch. So the switch you're seeing in this, uh, in this case is a very typical, very common magnetic door switch. Uh, it's one that, uh, the one that we use at uh, all the Maverick stores. You'll see them at Costco. It's, it's the one that Microthermal um, uh, distributes, but it's made by other manufacturers. So you'll see them all over the place. If you notice on this particular switch, there are two little arrows cast into the, uh, the aluminum. And those two arrows indicate the alignment uh, for which the magnet must be in order to properly um, trigger the magnet. And in this case, the magnet on the door with the, with the aluminum bracket you'll see there is not anywhere near inside of the uh, field uh, for the magnetic read inside to, to activate. So what we had to do to solve this problem was get the magnet into a closer position to the actual sensor in order to uh, operate properly. So there are a few different, uh, in this case here, we see that it wasn't a computer problem. It wasn't an input problem. It wasn't a problem with the magnet. It wasn't a problem with the wiring. It was just a installation problem. Now, it's not always an installation problem. This bracket sticks out. It, it could fall off, it could get knocked off, bumped off. Um, but this is just a very, very basic example of investigating what the computer is actually looking for and seeing and some scenarios that uh, disrupt the process of uh, the application. <clears throat> so in this case here, the, here's another scenario. After locating the physical input wires, let's say we're not getting a magnetic closure indication. We also have a door closure that's not being indicated. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go and second guess what the, what the controller is seeing. And uh, we're going to check for continuity. 
So if the this time the digital multi your meter is going to respond and it shows the switch is con is closed, and that the controller is having a um, uh, problem. So what we're going to do here is now we want to be able to take control of what the of what we're doing uh, with the controller. And so we see that the actual continuity on our beeper is good and the board for some reason is not reading um, the system. So now what we're going to do is next verify to make sure that the board input power for the circuit board is actually reading what it's supposed to be reading or getting the power that's supposed to be reading. One of the very important key elements to any circuit board or any control system being able to measure its inputs or outputs is having the proper power supply at its board in order for it to generate its signals and do what it needs to do to read. So in this case, we're going to measure the power coming in and we're gonna find that it's actually good. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that means that, well, the system is not detecting its input or its output properly. So there are scenarios where you need to second guess the controller and you may find that the controller is in fact not reading properly on its input. The controller boards aren't, aren't infallible, they, they do go bad. Um, we just had a store just the other day, yesterday in fact, um, that has a uh, bad uh, analog input. The, the analog input was frozen at a, at a uh, given temperature for some reason um, and uh, causing the system to go haywire. Um, we just, in the program, we corrected it, told it to look at a different input, but um, you're gonna use your meter either way to determine if you've got uh, what the controller is actually seeing. The other thing that you've gotta be careful of is in some systems like uh, CPC, and you guys are probably familiar with it, CPC has a selector switch on their board to switch between whether or not that input is looking at an analog, looking for an analog value or a digital value. So on a CPC board, uh, the input board is, uh, if you have it in digital, it turns that input into a dry contact output basically. So it's always going to be looking for uh, continuity. If you have the switch in analog or transducer mode, then the that little dip switch on the board changes the circuit board's logic to now uh, seek out and read a voltage uh, coming back or, or resistance coming back. Um, so you have to make sure that the dip switch didn't get bumped or hit or somebody uh, uh, moved it by mistake, hit the wrong dip switch, but you gotta be uh, aware of the board to just, just eliminate all the possibilities before a board is condemned. So in this case, we would find that uh, the board input in fact is bad. Um, so the board has a failed input. Now some, Quite a few systems uh, allow you to switch that input to another input in the program if there's an input available. Um, some software applications do not, uh, but most of the applications that we have in the Maverick store are all done on custom programmed applications that allow us to mix and match uh, inputs and outputs. Um, Moving, uh, moving things to different inputs. If we lose a single input, we don't have to change out an entire board. Uh, we just make notes that uh, that board has a failed input and then um, switch it. And then if we start uh, finding more inputs failing on that board, then we'll change the board out. But um, we've uh, most, most uh, manufacturers and applications in the software will allow you to switch uh, inputs. Does anybody have any uh, questions before we move on? Okay. <clears throat> so, oh, I, sorry. I thought this slide was, uh, thought I removed this slide. So 
Here, here is a, uh, a slide that talks about the uh, dry contact versus wet contact. Uh, so just, just keep in mind of the control uh, system that you're working on, whether or not it's uh, wet or dry. Uh, if, the, uh, if it is a system that uses wet contacts, uh, you're going to be using your meter, meter in rather than in continuity mode, you're going to be using it actually in uh, voltage mode to find out when, uh, when power is coming, coming back. Um, you're not going to find a lot of wet contact um, uh, systems in, in our field. Again, you'll find them a lot if you're into uh, industrial areas. They use them a lot in, uh, in uh, processing equipment. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. Um, that. That's the main scenario. Um, I hope everybody understands. Uh, does everybody know what we're talking about when you see dry versus wet contacts? So, okay. <clears throat> so, again, this is uh, uh, that one we'll skip. So, <clears throat> now let's talk about uh, analog uh, inputs. Analog, to, to put it easily or to put it simply, uh, analog is just means variable. It's uh, just something that uh, is is uh, throttles or, or or varies from um, a minimum to a maximum. Um, <clears throat> everybody, I hope, really understands that um, and uh, can differentiate between what an analog and what a digital signal is. So the two types of analog inputs that we're going to see a lot in uh, that pretty much you're going to see everywhere is either temperature, uh, where we're using thermistors. Most of the manufacturers use thermistors. Um, some of them use uh, a variant of thermistors like RTDs, um, and uh, there's a handful of other applications that we'll go through later. Uh, the other type of analog input are transducers. Um, that's where you're gonna get your pressures, your humidity, liquid levels, leak detectors, light levels, currents. Um, you can have a current transducer where you just have a, a loop of wire running around the uh, uh, conductor and it's gonna send back a small amount of voltage as the current's flowing through the wire. That's what we use when we're reading uh, amps and current meters. So we've, we've got a couple that have current sensing CTs on everything um, there because we're doing some, uh, some testing on it. So. Those are the those are the two primary types of analog uh, sensors. Thermistors, we'll get into this a little bit, is a thermally sensitive resistor. So just like a fixed resistor, this one is actually got a substrate on it that uh, changes resistance in response to temperature. And you're going to see two types of thermistors, either a NTC or a PTC. NTC is a negative temperature coefficient, which is mostly what you're going to find out in the field. And a PTC is a positive temperature coefficient. So the <clears throat> NTCs, the, the resistance starts dropping as the sensor gets hotter and hotter. So in other words, current can pass through the resistor easier the hotter, the hotter it gets. So if you're out on a microthermal system, for example, and you happen to be on a call where it says, where it's reading 302 degrees, uh, and it's, you know, in fact, it's not 300 degrees because the sensor is mounted in a prep table or in a walk-in cooler or something. Uh, 302 degrees is simply the highest reading scale of that particular sensor. And at that temperature, that is when the sensor is pretty much a dead short for the, uh, for the uh, thermistor. So if you're on a uh, microthermal store and you see 302, that means the wire is just physically shorted. 
unless in fact you're at 300 degrees, but I seriously doubt it. Um, <laughs> so if you see a, th uh, a sensor in microthermal, and it'll be alarming at this point um, at, at 302, it means that the wires that the sensor at the, the, the board is reading a direct short across that input. So generally that's a, uh, a shorted wire, a pinched wire. Uh, it happens a lot in the prep table applications, uh, which hopefully we'll eliminate when we start using some wireless stuff, but that's coming down the, down the road soon. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, if you see conversely, if the wire reading goes open, with microthermal, you're going to see a minus 58 because minus 58 Fahrenheit is open air. That, that is 100% uh, uh, re uh, resistance. And I think I've said that wrong. So the, the maximum, the least amount of resistance is a dead short. So that means that every bit of the signal leaving the board is coming back and uh, and it's increase it's decreasing its resistance with heat. <clears throat> I, I had my verbiage backwards there. So a minus fifty eight on a on a microthermal sensor means that there's no none of the power leaving the board is coming back to the board, or it's a, it's actually open. So that would uh, represent a cut sensor. The sensor wire has been cut or severed. Um, <clears throat> both, uh, one of the, the most common thermistors used are what we call 10K um, sensors. And they're called 10K because that is the resistance at 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. Um, it's just a, that's kind of a center temperature mark, 25 degrees Celsius um, is just kind of a benchmark uh, level for referring to uh, thermistors. So if you hear it's a 10K, it's 10,000 at 25 Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have exactly, if you're ever wondering the resistance scale, you can find that out. And <clears throat> we can look at the different curves from the different manufacturers of uh, of the thermistors, whether or not they're RTDs, um, thermistors, or thermal couples. Here is a small little chart that shows uh, the different uh, current, uh, the different resistance scales, and and what happens with the the three different uh, temperature um, sensors you'll see out in the field. Um, so, unlike RTDs and thermocouples, uh, therm thermos thermistors do not have uh, standards associated with their resistance versus temperatures or characteristics or curves. Um, there's a lot of different ones to choose from. Um, that's why you'll hear uh, manufacturers refer to them as 10K, 3K, 2K. Um, they all have a, 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 different, a different curve. Um, some of them are stable at different temperatures. Um, it just depends on the manufacturer what, uh, what, we're, what we're using, uh, what's being used. So just be aware that uh, thermistors are, uh, have different values. Most control systems like microthermal and CPC, if you happen to have a, uh, you don't have the right temperature sensor, you have a different one. Uh, chances are we can just change the programming to uh, accommodate the sensor that you do have and still read the same um, accuracy and readings of what uh, what's needed to get the job done. So here's how we would diagnose a thermistor. So let's say we're not reading, the system's not displaying uh, the value properly. Uh, like for instance, the situation we had the other day, we got a call, the alarm call, because it said the store temperature was 245 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we knew that that was wrong because the fire department was not out there. <laughs> uh, so we know that we've either got a problem with the thermistor, 
being a fault in the field or there's a problem with the controller or the uh, fault on the board. So to find the cause uh, of the symptom, we need to step back and understand what's happening and, and know what value we should be seeing in order to uh, translate what it is that we're wanting to what it is we're supposed to be reading. Um, so the normal diagnostic procedure is just to make sure that the power supply is proper um, and again knowing the equipment that we're working on. In this case we have one reading that's off the rest of everything else the board is doing and reading is fine. So we would tend not to even bother with checking voltage at the board because if, uh, if our voltage was wrong, we would have more than just one reading. So <clears throat> what we would do is need to check to see where our scale is and what actual reading we're reading is here. Now, generally we don't have to get in this deep. Uh, to your, to your controller because you're gonna be able to know very quickly if the reading is wrong uh, by disconnecting the wire. Uh, and in this case, uh, in, the, in the scenario we had the other day, we pulled the wires off of the board, off microthermal board, in order to perform this test here and see what resistance we were actually reading. Now, in this case, we pulled the sensor off the board and the reading did not change. That means that the problem is inside of the board. And at that point, now we need to take over into the uh, software and see what's going on and, and see if there's anything we can do to correct it. But in the field, <clears throat> there might, you're not always gonna have a, 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 a scenario where it's so blatantly off that it's, uh, it's pretty obvious which one uh, which uh, item is bad. Now, if you do pull your wire off and you get any sort of temperature other than fully open or minus 58 or whatever your control system indicates for a uh, full resistance um, coil, then you know that your board is reading something it shouldn't if there's no wires there. So the chart we're looking at here is representative of, a, uh, of, a, of an actual microthermal sensor, and it's and it's the same as true with a uh, with pretty much any 10k uh, resistor. Um, most manufacturers will publish uh, the resistive scale for the sensors they're using. What this allows you to do is calibrate your sensor in the field to verify your your uh, what you're reading is actually what you're getting. So you can do this with your uh, digital multimeter by producing one of these temperatures uh, to a, to getting into the, uh, putting the sensor in the right temperature uh, and then me measuring the corresponding ohms uh, for it in that value. So let's say uh, ice bath test is one of the most common ways to verify this. So you'll take your 10K sensor get yourself a cup of uh, crushed ice and uh, add a bit of water to it. So you got your ice slushy mixture that pretty much guarantees you have uh, just above freezing or around 32 and a half degrees or 32 point something degrees Fahrenheit. You'll drop your resistor, your thermistor into the ice bath and you can measure the resistance of it. And so if you, follow the uh, temperature, the chart that we have here, it's probably hard to see, but at zero degrees Celsius or 30 degree, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or 32.2, we'd see that the ohms reading on this is 34,380. So, and the distance between, or the difference between 32 and 33.8, 32, it's reading 32,000, I think 680, and uh, 33.8 is 31,040 ohms. So it does change quite a bit. The computer can actually read that quite, quite uh, easily. But if you've got a thermistor for uh, uh, an application where you can't see the physical value, uh, a, a perfect example of this would be uh, a demand cooling module on a, on a Copeland um, compressor. Uh, 
that sensor, Copeland does publish uh, their uh, demand cooling thermistor values. You can't, that, that doesn't have a uh, display on it to show you the temperature. But if you're questioning whether or not that sensor is accurate or not, the only way to do so would be to take that thermistor, put it in an actual temperature of known value, and then measure the resistance according to the manufacturer's chart for it to verify whether or not that, that thermistor is, uh, is bad or, or within reason. Does uh, everybody understand the resistive curve um, and, uh, and, and uh, correlating temperature for a thermistor? Hopefully, hopefully that, that all uh, makes sense. Okay. Hey, hey Scott. Yeah, yeah. Can we uh, get like a PDF of that? Something? I didn't hear that. Say it again. Um, your thermistor chart is that like a PDF, like you could share, or is that just uh, for that manufacturer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get that. Uh, in fact, uh, that is just a. Uh, you'll notice it's written in French up top. That is actually available, I think, from micro from if you go to Sporland's website and go to the microthermal page, I believe it's in the documentation. If not, yes, I'll, I'll get you this uh, this this one here, um, and it's and again, it's good for CPC as well. Um, the 10K sensors pretty, are, are pretty much identical. Um, so, uh, absolutely. Um, we can get you this uh, this exact uh, uh, chart from from microthermal. Um, I just sent out to uh, one of the guys here in Tucson uh, the Copeland bulletin that has the same scale for the demand cooling module. Um, but yeah, so if you guys don't see it, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll and I'll send you this uh, this exact chart and the the um, I've got a few different uh, sensor profiles. Uh, for some of the sensors you'll see out there. Now, they're gonna be the same, keep in mind too, the, the mounting configuration for the sensor doesn't change this chart. So the sensors you're used to seeing with uh, at Maverick, you, you know, you've got the typical green wire, which is a stainless steel bullet. But then we also have the orange wire, which is the brass uh, pipe clamp mount uh, sensor. Um, there's also the duct probes, the, the six, eight, 10, 12 inch long duct probes, which are stainless steel. Internally, the little thermistor that's inside of all those is identical. Um, the only thing that changes is the mass uh, reaction time because of the material of the uh, sensor. So um, all the sensors are the, the same. Even the even the tiny uh, slab probes that we use in the um, uh, in the uh, prep tables and uh, condiment wells. So keep in mind, just as, as long as you know it, the the standard resistance, uh, 10k, 3k, 2k, um, you'll be able to uh, find the find the resistance chart. So yeah, if if anybody needs these uh, document curves or these charts, just send me an email if you don't find them. So now let's discuss the fundamentals of a transducer. So a transducer is simply a, um, is a sensor uh, that will return a specific amount of voltage that it receives it, it's given a standard voltage, and as it changes its uh, pressure or its value, reactive, its physical reactive curve changes the amount of voltage being sent back to the control system. So uh, it takes its voltage uh, from the board, and then we'll just send back a specific amount of that voltage in in relative uh, uh, amounts to what it is, it is uh, sending out. So you're gonna see, you have to have the right voltage arriving to your transducer in order to get any of it coming back. So uh, 
it, it's not reactive on resistance, it's reactive on voltage coming back. So let's, uh, let's go through a diagnostic scenario for a transducer. So let's say we have a pressure transducer on a system and we know that the pressure it's displaying on screen is not the pressure that we're physically measuring. So there's, again, with just like the digital input, there's only two possibilities. There's either a problem with the transducer or a fault in the field, meaning it's physically not getting its right pressure or it is and the transducer is not sending the right information back or the controller is unable to read or measure the proper um, uh, voltage or sent back. In other words, it's, it's either a problem with the transducer or something in the field or it's on the board itself. So to find the cause of the system, Again, we have to understand what the controller is doing and what's supposed to be happening and know that the different configuration properties um, that we're looking for in order to diagnose this. So uh, good gauges, good accurate gauges um, are, are important, um, especially when it comes into the calibration part of this. Uh, if it's very, very far off, you don't, wouldn't necessarily even need to hook up a gauge. So. Um, and again, you also have to understand the circuit board's uh, baseline measuring and baseline things like the board's power supply, grounding network, just, just same, same like any uh, input. Um, you got to be aware of uh, um, what the board it needs in order for it to measure right. But if you got one reading that's off and the rest of everything on that board is reading right, you probably wouldn't need to waste your time checking the board's power supply. I have a question, um, instructor. Yeah. Uh, when you ch if you have to change out a transducer, do you have to recover the freon in a small system, for as you know a you know refrigeration system in a store, or in a rack? Um, if you have to add transducer. What you have to do to replace them? Is there any so down a refrigerant or what? Yeah, so generally, generally the transducer is, you're gonna see two types of mounting. Uh, what, we, what you'll see at like the Maverick stores and most of what we try and install are all on a quarter inch flare and they have a, a valve deflator on them. So you wouldn't necessarily have to recover anything. You should be able to unthread the um, transducer right off of that quarter inch flare because it's got a, a, a depressor in there that's actually depressing it. So it would be the same as pulling your gauges off. Now, it's only as reliable as the core underneath and sometimes cores don't seat properly, but you <laughs> can only find that out the hard way. On a rack, the transducer is going to be a better be mounted on a some sort of a, an access valve or a, a small um, service valve where you can actually shut off or isolate that transducer uh, from the system. So the, the transducer will have a, uh, some manufacturers use a little quarter turn ball valve and the transducer is threaded into a fitting on the other side of the ball valve. So if you're gonna change the transducer, you just close the valve, unthread the transducer, put the new transducer on, and then open your valve back up and you're good to go. So generally speaking, there's going to be some sort of isolation way to be able to replace that without having to do any sort of pump downs or, uh, or, um, or uh, recoveries. So you have to worry about loss of free on then. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, it's a, it's a, it's a consumable part or well, it's a, it's a replaceable part. So, usually we're the manufacturers think of that uh, ahead of time to try and make it as convenient as possible so we uh, uh, microthermal and other manufacturers make those the transducers uh, with the quarter inch SAE uh, fitting with a valve depressor to make installation uh, simple but if you have if it's mounted on a, uh, a service valve you know like the uh, the service valves where you use your service wrench to close them, then you just simply shut off the valve um, to isolate the sensor from the system and, and you wouldn't have to um, do any sort of recovery or pump down or any, any of that. Um, okay. Of course, it's a different story if you unthread it off the quarter inch fitting and it doesn't 
stop flowing and you kind of do something there. It's a little scary sometimes with those uh, Schrader depressors, but generally speaking, you can pull them off and unthread them quickly. And, and most of the transducers will have uh, some sort of wire disconnect, um, like the Parker transducers that we use at Microthermal. You just pull the wire off and then that allows you to spin that transducer quite rapidly. Um, so we just pull the wire off, take your wrench, and then uh, loosen it, and then just spin it off as fast as you can, allowing that valve core to seat quickly. Um, if you pull it off really slowly, obviously, unlike a gauge fitting um, on your gauges where you have a big rubber seal and you have a bit of leeway, you can turn your gauge, your the knurled fitting on your gauge a few times before before you actually start venting refrigerant. The transducers uh, should have a copper flare gasket underneath them. So you have very little leeway on what's leaking and what's not leaking. So um, the proper practice would be to loosen it and then spin it off as quick as possible. So that way you can get, let that valve core seat as quick as possible. Okay. But good, good, yeah, good question. Because that's uh, we get that. Uh, that it, it's it makes me nervous when I see a transducer on a fitting and no valve underneath it. You, you just kind of have to assume that there's a. You hope there's a core under there. <laughs> okay, so if it wasn't a core, install one. Uh, well, in that case, uh, then you'll have to either pump it down or or recover it if it's a small small system. If it's on a branch circuit of, at a rack, then you'd have to pump it down. Um, but yeah, if it uh, if it looks like it's uh, blowing gas at a at a rate un, uncontrollable, then yeah, yeah, that's kind of a worst case scenario. Okay. So yeah, good 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 question. So let's, uh, uh, anyway, back to the uh, diagnostics. So the, again, the problem is gonna either be a fault with the transducer or a fault with the controller. So if you know uh, everything is good um, and uh, uh, to begin testing, what we, need to, what we need to be able to do is know what's, what's going on. So <clears throat> let's look a little bit at how we would test a transducer. So typically you're going to see either 5 or 15 volt transducers. Um, some manufacturers differ, you just need to know what it is that you're looking at. Uh, but you're always going to have a power supply, uh, your positive volts, and your voltage ground. It's not an earth ground, it's just the voltage ground. And that's where you're going to measure how much voltage your transducer is seeing. So if we have a uh, transducer, transducer that is reading something erroneous, uh, at the transducer itself, you can unplug the transducer and you're going to measure to make sure, first thing you're going to check is just to make sure that you actually have the proper amount of voltage reaching the transducer. So with the case of Microthermal or Maverick at, or at Costco um, and, and most of the rack manufacturers, you're going to find they, they use the 5 volt transducers you should always have a good solid five volts DC, remember it's DC, not AC, uh, at the power and your ground at the transducer. When you have the plug off, when you have the transducer unplugged and the plug in your hand, you're only gonna measure voltage at the power wire and the ground wire. You're not gonna read anything if you try and measure on the white wire or green wire, uh, depending on what color it is. Um, the signal wire, because the wire's in your hand and what you have in your hand is what the board is actually looking to read. <clears throat> so to find out then, so let's say we have a, a transducer that's reading a, a bad reading and we confirm that it's getting its five volts of power, we're gonna plug it back in. And then, then what we need to do is measure how much of that voltage is coming back to the controller. And we do that by, by hooking up to the ground and the signal wire. Because remember the transducer is gonna be sending a portion of its voltage that it's receiving back to the controller. And the transducer is, the scaling inside of the meter 
is done uh, inside the computer in the configuration of the controller. So a five volt transducer is going to send back its scale regardless of what pressure scale is on the other side of that sensor. So in other words, a 200 pound suction sensor is going to return the same voltage as a 500 PSI uh, sensor does throughout its scale, except the amount of voltage is relative to the pressure application. So in other words, if uh, we've had a couple instances where the wrong transducer was selected inside of the software and it wasn't reading right, even though our voltage scale is relatively the same, the materials used inside of the transducer differ. Uh, so uh, a 500 pound transducer Gives, requires a lot more pressure to return the same amount of voltage as a 200 pound transducer. I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, if, if that makes sense, but uh, the voltage returned is relative to the uh, sensor's uh, scale of, of reading. Does that, does that make sense? Um, I don't know how I can, how I can hopefully you guys get what I get. I don't know how to word that, but, but anyway, even though the uh, uh, voltage scale is all the same, it's relative to how much pressure that transducer is able to see. So you, you can have the wrong transducer or install the wrong transducer and a replacement um, and uh, we won't be reading the right, uh, the right values because that the scale, what changes is, is the amount of voltage that can be returned at that pressure scale. But it's always gonna be between those two voltages regardless of um, what it is that's on the other side. So just be aware of the value of your transducer um, when, you're, uh, when you're looking at uh, measuring these things. Does that, does that, yeah. So you're saying that if I want to measure the voltage going back to the controller, I measure through black and white to see what the value is. If it's five volts going, DC volts going in, and I measure through black and white, I should read maybe 3.5 or 4.5 going back. Correct. Do I, do I read that? Do I read that taking the plug off or do I read that at the controller? That would be at the controller because uh, if you have your transducer unplugged, it's, there's nothing there on the wire. So this would be measuring at the controller. Now, if you can get your wire, if you can get your meter on the, on the contacts at the transducer, as long as the transducer is plugged in, you would be reading uh, your, the black wire ground and then the white wire now becomes your positive voltage return back. Okay, that's the signal that's coming back to the controller to let the controller know what the pressure is inside that pipe. Exactly, and, it, and, and the relative voltage that I'm talking about has to do with the range of that transducer. So if, you're, if, you, if you have a 200 PSI transducer, we know that the, that the voltage return is gonna be between a half a volt and 4.5 volts. So 4.5 volts returning means that you have at least 200 psi it's at its maximum uh, pressure scale reading okay and and then if you have zero if you have nothing there you're going to be reading a half a volt dc there it's at its minimum scale so if you go and you're reading let's say let's say you 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 read you put your meter on there and you read like 2.2 volts well 2.2 volts is right dead center in the middle of a 0.5 to 4.5. So you could assume you're somewhere around 100 PSI in there. Okay. And then the same thing would be true with a 500 PSI transducer. So if you have a 500 PSI transducer and you put your uh, gauge on there and you have only 100 PSI, you're going to have closer to one something volts, uh, but you would uh, 
uh, and then if you have 250 PSI in there, you're right in the middle of your, of your maximum range. So that's where 250 PSI on a 500 pound transducer is going to produce 2.2 volts. Where uh, 100 PSI on a 200 pound scale is going to produce 2.2 volts. Now, when you say 500 pounds, uh, transducer, it can range up to 500 pounds, but it's not 500 pounds inside that pressure, inside that. Is that in the discharge side is reading? Yes, yeah, so it, when I say a 500 PSI transducer, I'm referring to the scale of the range of that particular transducer. So, pounds. okay, gotcha. <clears throat> right, so what you'll see is, uh, so uh, to be more precise, what you'll see in the field, Typically in, on racks, you're gonna have a 100 or 200 pound transducer scales on the suction lines. And then on the discharge or liquid lines, you're gonna have a 500 PSI. Gotcha. Now it, with, with Maverick, because we're using uh, 410A on, on HVAC applications, Parker produces what they call a 652 PSI transducer. It's one that they developed for using on CO2 applications where you have to read above where your pressure is typically go above 500 psi so it's just relative you just got to be aware of what scale or what model transducer you're using uh in order to be able to uh get your relative voltage feedback uh, uh variable that you're that you're measuring so yeah so anytime you hear a transducer referred to as a x psi it's referring to its maximum range um, of value. Right. Then that let me know if I have, I have a, a lower or high side transducer in my hand or not. Ex exactly. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. <clears throat> All right. And, uh, and we have had that happen um, in the field where uh, the wrong transducers were grabbed and installed um, and the pressures were just really off. We had a we had a big glitch with a lot of the Mavericks where I'm, I'm sure you guys may have experienced it. Um, where, and it was all in the software setup. Um, the 652 PSI transducers, <clears throat> we moved to those because of the R410A um, pressures on, on the HVAC units. Well, the programming in the computer was not done right to accommodate that sensor. It wasn't formatted right. So we were reading bad pressures. So just keep in mind that there's a, a few steps of setup uh, and, and, and measuring on, on transducers. So um, this is, I think we're getting close to the end of the thing here. Um, the relay outputs on boards are pretty much self-explanatory. Um, the relay, uh, the outputs on the, on the circuit board are typically always gonna have a common and a normally open and a normally closed. Uh, most manufacturers have a way to test the relay without needing to go into the software. Um, CPC has a dip switch that you can actually change the default state of the relay, which will switch the relay. It will actually energize the relay. Um, just be careful if you're using the dip switches to verify your, your software, because if you leave them in the state, you'll, it'll stay in that opposite state. Microthermal uses a tiny little test button where you push the button and when you push in the button, it energizes the relay. So if you're doubting in the field on a, a, a microthermal board, whether or not the relay is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, you can just go right up, push the button and activate the relay. Um, so like on an RTU unit, for example, um, you want to verify that the compressor uh, wire, compressor will actually start with relay number two. You can push that button um, and energize that relay right away and then utilize your meter to verify the contacts close. Um, relays go bad. I mean, if you have a catastrophic short on something, you can blow the relay points inside a little board and it can't do what it needs to do. So just, again, the relays are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then the analog outputs, most, most of the circuit boards have analog outs and you'll see them like, for example, we're doing more and more VFDs with Maverick. So uh, the circuit boards have an analog out signal 
Um, the analog out is configurable, so it can be configured to 0 to 10, 10 to 0, 2 to 10, 5 to 0, 0 to 5, 4 to 20 milliamp, or 20 to 4 milliamp. Um, you just got to know what that analog output is configured to be doing um, in order to measure what it, what it is in fact doing. Um, uh, is that, uh, that, that's, I don't know how much detail we need to go into that. Do you guys uh, follow that? Yep. And then the last, uh, the last type of output that you'll see in on the boards, uh, these are not as common, but these are for solid state um, relays. So solid state relays are the ones that you'll see for anti-sweat controllers. Um, solid state relays actually send a small voltage out. Um, and uh, the only board that you'll see with microthermal that has it beyond the anti-sweat controller board is there is a, uh, there is a solid state output on the case controller uh, to control a single solid state relay. Um, and then the other, the other output that we're not gonna go into today, um, that would be a whole day class on its own is the stepper motors for the electronic TXVs, electronic EPRs and, and such. Uh, we will have a class later on that, on that workshop. So um, that, uh, I think that concludes what we had. So uh, is there any, you guys got any, uh, any questions or anything to, uh, else you wanted to go over real quick before we sign off? Um. Hey, thanks for your time, man. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. I'll, uh, we'll have a good one next week uh, as well. So we'll see you, uh, everybody, back uh, Friday morning. I'll have a new slideshow for everybody then. <laughs> thanks. thanks for the class. All right, guys. Thanks for thanks for coming in. Thanks for uh, joining.